All right. Yes. Okay. We are live. We are live. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear and see all of us. <laughs> can you hear Sally? Okay. Do you see us? But okay. All right. I'm a, here we go. Here we go. I think something good happened. Okay, right. I can't see Sally, but I see a third screen. Okay, that Sally, are you, are, can you say something? Are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yay. <laughs> Great. All right. Okay, the technical gods are in our favor. I'm sorry, Nima. <laughs> We know you. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. We are live. Apologies for the technical difficulties. You know, every time we try to do something powerful and educational, the Zucker Bros are not happy about that. But I am France Francois. I am the founder of In Culture Company. And this is the second of our series called Summer Schooled, where we invite scholars, thinkers, and activists that are of Dominican and Haitian descent or adjacent to DR in Haiti to talk about their work and how they're trying to change our little island. So with me today, I have Dr. Ann Eller and I will let you introduce yourself, Dr. Ann Eller. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm excited for this conversation. No introductions, that's it? <laughs> no, that's good. Okay, well, all right. Well, I'll teach your home for you. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Ann Eller is currently a professor at Yale University and she's the author of the book, We Dream Together, that is specifically focused on the 1865 period of history in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and talking about the, the way the DR revolution at that time and Haiti as its counterpart has been positioned in, um, in the Caribbean literature and how we think of ourselves as Afro-Caribbean people. Sali, are you here? Are you still with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Would you introduce yourself? Sure. Saudi. I'm a member of the Enculture Company team. I'm also uh, a doctoral student at New York University studying anthropology. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to join this conversation. Awesome. Okay. And we're going to kind of jump right into it. We get this question a lot and we just want to just lay it out right now, right off the bat. Did Haiti enslave the DR? No. <laughs> no. So no, they ended the they ended slavery on Dominican territory. Juridically, it happened twice. Uh, the first time with Toussaint, although he didn't have very much time in the east of the island, and he sort of indirectly affirmed it by the constitution, uh, but firmly and completely in early 1822 uh, with the unification of both parts of the island. Uh, and there's new scholarship that understands as many as perhaps 10,000 people were freed. Um, so there's brand new work by a scholar named Andrew Walker and Maria Cecilia Ulrichsen about those people who are freed at that moment. So can you give us, set the stage for us before, before we even talk about Spain coming and re-annexing um, what is to become the Dominican Republic, what was happening on the island between 1822 and 1844? Sure. Um, well, uh, the short answer is, of course, a lot, um, but not very much changes after the abolition of slavery. So traditional scholars, uh, for example, working during the Trujillo dictatorship might have emphasized the letter of the law about the rural code that ruled both parts of the island. Um, but newer work by people like Quisque Alora, who is a historian who's a member of the Academy of History in Santo Domingo, um, she just did a big uh, study of Higüe during the whole period of unification. And she finds that slavery ends right away and then life pretty much proceeds as before. 
So those people who are involved in wood cutting are doing that. People who are involved in cattle culture are doing that. Actually, the, that economy grows during this period of 22 to 44. And so does tobacco. Another thing that grows, unfortunately, in this period, even though this is the very first united island and a, the only space of Caribbean independence, is pressure against the island from being independent. And so people might know a little bit about um, the pressures directed against Haiti. You might know that the United States, for example, doesn't recognize them until 1862 together with Liberia, et cetera. But neither does Britain. And France is straight up sending warships and demanding so-called indemnities and, and payback. And that hostility doesn't shrink uh, with the years after Haiti gets its independence. It actually grows. And so as slavery is ended finally um, in 1834 and fully in 1838 in some of the British islands, there is like a, a crescendo of racist and imperialist energy around the so-called failure of the end of slavery in which people who imagine themselves allied with the planter classes uh, decide that the failure of plantations, of course, the success of freedom and small farms is something to be lamented uh, and it's at the same time that they're getting really powerful uh, mechanics of imperialism to spread across the Atlantic, like the Gatlin gun, like steam power, et cetera. And so this whole time, Haiti and the Dominican Republic together under the flag of Haiti are sort of like quietly independent, uh, but the waters around them are getting only more and more and more hostile as the time passes. Yeah, and I think that that's really great context to understand that like, Haiti and what is to become the Dominican Republic are basically this one spot of freedom in a sea of slave owning nations. So their, their freedom is constantly under threat. And so in 1844, the two countries separate. And was this, was this a war? What, what, how was the separation framed by the um, Dominicans that lived at that time? Yeah, so uh, the first thing just to answer that kind of emphasize exactly what you're saying is that it's not like Latin American independence. The pressure against it is, is huge um, and we can return to that in a moment. Um, but that said, uh, the process of separation in 44 is like, like an appendage sort of lopping off. It's really anticlimactic. So Boyer holds power for longer than anyone holds power on the island, Haitian president or Dominican president, for the entire century. He holds power for more than 20 years, which is sort of miraculous if you figure that there's maybe only 70,000 people in the territory of the East at the beginning, so there's not much holding this together. Um, and then eventually when he does fall, he falls because of a whole series of events. So uh, there is a May 1842 earthquake, which is really catastrophic. There's even a tidal wave. I think that it, I can't remember where the tidal wave reaches, but in Puerto Plata and Santiago de los Caballeros, in Capaicián, and all these different places, the massive number of buildings are affected. Uh, Port au Prince burns several times. Um, there's a peasant movement in the south of Haiti um, with which uh, folks might be familiar called the Pique, um, with Salomon Père is leading folks, and there's other folks who are moving around there. There's movements in Lecay for. Uh, democratic reform. There's a number of Dominicans who are allied with this democratic reform movement. It has a lot of energy. They meet a lot. In fact, they're just betrayed by Boyer's successor. There's people who want French annexation. I'm sorry, I could go on for a really long time, but the point is there's like all these plans, basically, uh, of the like could have, maybe, would have, might have, almost did. Um, and there's like a really small group of folks that everyone knows about in the capital of Santo Domingo who are the Trinitarios. And so the Trinitarios are actually a very small group. Uh, and one of them, Ramon Mella, uh, is actually involved in the reform efforts. And so you see after 1844, when independence or separation rather happens in Santo Domingo, it doesn't happen till a month later in Santiago Los Caballeros. Uh, Pedro Santana, with whom many of people might know is the uh, Dominican Republic's first president, his battles are like a handful of people he actually has to have bring more troops to the capital to suppress black residents of Santo Domingo than he does to separate from Haiti. Uh, a lot of officials just left town to just sort of let separation happen. And so um, 
that's how it happens at the time. It's just rewritten as a really enormous and heroic struggle about 40 years later. Uh, and so there's a really wonderful book in Spanish uh, for folks who are curious about that um, called Los Espejos de Duarte by Pablo Mella that talks a lot about how did this 1840s myth that everyone knows, like the heroic Trinitarios, Duarte above all, like how did this ha how did this come to be the story that we know when what the actual story is is like really, really kind of like plural and complex, but also like totally anticlimactic. Like, like how did this get not only just cleaned up, but also like distorted so completely. And so that's one, one place to read more. Right, so let me just put this into context. So you're saying that there are actually a lot of different movements going on on the island, cross border movements, some were for democracy, some were for different things. And then in, in Santo Domingo, in the capital, you have a small group of elite that form the Trinitarios and have their own thing going on that's completely different from what everybody else on the island has going on. And, and But they are the ones whose history stands today, even though, and they're the ones that, that have been glorified, even though they don't, they didn't necessarily represent all the movements and all the needs of the people at that time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's um, it involves like a lot of oversimplifications and distortions. So there are towns, basically the whole swath of El Sub Profundo, like the deep south, heading towards like all the cattle economy that would lead to Port-au-Prince, so like Bani, Las Matas, San Juan, and other places. There are towns in that valley, in the San Juan Valley, that continue to raise the Haitian flag for several years. Santana, who will later rewrite the struggle as one of civilizations between the two, um, like this, this tremendous clash. Um, he actually supported the French protectorate for a while uh, when he didn't think he would necessarily uh, win. And then of course there's a lot of opposition in the capital as this is unfolding. Um, it's, all, it's all profoundly messy. And so the cleaning up of the story and then making the big hero of the story, Juan Pablo Duarte, uh, is one, again, turning to the work of Pablo Mella, uh, he analyzes why Duarte, because Duarte never held power. As a matter of fact, Duarte wasn't anti-Haitian. Uh, as a matter of fact, Duarte comes to this ruling junta in the capital city, who are mostly white, but they won't talk about it. And he brings a piece of paper that says, let's affirm the principle of unity of all of the races. And they shred the piece of paper. <laughs> so like, why is this man and then he's banished. I mean, Santana kicks him out within two years. He ends up, he's, he's feverish. He has like poor health this whole time. Like his sister ends up writing his story. Like how is this man, the man uh, he, what, with the ideas that he had and that are laudable, they're not the ones that are reported, but they're, they were laudable and interesting. How is he the one that ends up being canonized? And so Pablo Mella argues like exile stories are disciplinary stories because they're stories of martyrship and sacrifice. And so if you have this blonde haired, blue eyed man, the son of a Spanish merchant, et cetera, as this perfect hero who never actually held power, well, it's a very small state uh, that's very much divorced from the people. So if he had, he would have probably become unpopular quickly. This is the perfect person to use. He's phenotypically perfect. Uh, and in every way, it's a disciplinary narrative without being overt uh, in its racism. Right. And so there's actually a recent book about um, Dominican history books uh, called oh gosh, Unmastering the Script. It just came out on the University of Alabama Press and they study a lot of traditional Dominican narratives that are taught in schools uh, about this independence period. And they note that it relies on the great man theory that they make Duarte into a great man, these books. Um, and that's kind of perfectly ironic uh, in terms of white supremacist narratives because the theory of great men was invented by Thomas Carlyle, who's like a horrible racist. He's a horrible Scottish racist who ends up arguing that slavery should never have been abolished at the exact moments that Duarte is writing in, in favor of Haitian republicanism and, and other things. Right, so what I find interesting about this like Duarte myth is that Duarte has become a symbol of the Dominican far right. They, these Dominican white nationalist movement hold them up as this blonde haired blue eyed founding father, even though, as you mentioned, he never held power. Um, but he's also the antithesis, 
like who Duarte actually was is the antithesis of what the Dominican state represents today in some ways. Like Duarte, Duarte was very much pro-black, pro-Haitian, pro-multicultural. And, but that is not how we see him represented in um, the current mythology. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about your book is that you don't just focus on what's written because what we found is that the people who get to write history um, are usually the white landowning elite who aren't working out all day in the sun and who are educated. But you also use a lot of other historical records. And can you tell us a little bit about what that, what those historical records told you about the Dominican Republic at that time? Sure. Well, first, one poem that might be trotted out a lot uh, about Duarte is a poem with which you might be familiar. It's like, Los Blancos Morenos, Corrizo Cruzados, Machamos Serenos. Uh, folks listening might be very familiar with this poem. It's like, uh, it's his most famous poem, and it's often used to silence his discussion of race because it could appear that he's saying, we're all one when what he's actually doing is articulating the different members of the Dominican Republic at that time. Uh, and this is the last thing I'll say about Pablo Mayo's book, other than go and buy it, uh, which is that he probably wrote that during the Restoration War in the 1860s and not the 1840s as people think. Um, and so that's just another reason that he also understood the message of the Restoration fighters, which is the question that you're asking. How do we find the history of these folks who left absolutely no record? And that is one of the great legacies of the Restoration War, as we can see really clearly a very commonly and firmly and vigilantly held political consensus about the importance of defending the independence of the island. And that anti-colonialism and anti-slavery were hand in hand. It was incredibly uh, vigilant. It was a keen consensus. It, it made people rise up and fight so quickly that observers were in awe. They speak of lava or uh, the masses dragging up everybody else, of an uncontainable volcano. Uh, and that's a testament to a, a bunch of discussions that of people who didn't leave any writing, but who had a commitment to their own personal autonomy, to their own communities. Uh, to their own geographic networks, their own religious brotherhoods, etc., in a way that you just kind of have to piece together bit by bit. So the first chapter of the book is mostly that. It's trying to piece together who lived where, what were their effective communities, how can we get not just at threats, but a sense of esteem? Uh, what did it mean that slavery ended generations ago uh, when it didn't end anywhere else, right? Like, what did it mean to be a resident of a historic maroon community like Los Mina? who's now, of course, part of the capital, but was still exterior, as San Carlos was at the time. What did it mean to live in the literal wreckage of um, a sugar plantation? And so some of the rewriting uh, that, that racism never occurred here or that slavery was a moment only in the 1500s denies the very architecture, which is still visible from the highway if you drive from the airport to the capital. And you can understand sort of a very different moral understanding, a very different common sense understanding of like what the present meant what the future was, the elite at this time are playing with fire. And they're doing so gleefully and they don't think it's a threat. So they're happily uh, enacting programs, most of them fail, of white colonization. Like there's one from France that totally fails in the early 1840s. And they're totally toying around with the idea of giving themselves back to another country, probably France, uh, less likely Britain. Britain is not interested as they're already doing other imperial things. Uh, elsewhere. And they are really playing with slavery on a razor's edge and they don't mind. Uh, they don't seem to be afraid of the populace. Cons foreign consuls give us records. They're like, what are they doing? The mass of Dominicans will probably rise up if this happens. Uh, but the elites didn't feel that way until we have the Restoration War. And that's how we have an idea of what these people thought. So you've got this white elite, small elite in the capital that's ruling over a black and brown mass. One of, one of the questions that I think we get a lot is how was 1844 versus 1865 framed? And for those um, who are watching who might not be familiar with the dates, 1844 is when um, DR and what was called Spanish, I'm sorry, Spanish Haiti, which is now DR and Haiti separated at the time. And then 1865 is the period that we're, we're gonna be discussing in more detail when um, the, the DR overthrows Spain. So how was that framed for them? Because now we see 1844 
framed as uh, Independence Day, and then 1865 framed as um, a Restoration Day. But an interesting conversation I had with Keske Alora in the DR was that you can't call it a restoration day because you didn't have a state to re restore yet. She says, she says like we, there was no Dominican state at that time. There was no functioning government. So what exactly are you restoring? This should be 1865 should be thought of as um, independence day. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, eh, so there's another few dates to throw at you if, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know Real if this is going to muddy the waters, but um, I mean, separation is clearly not it for the most, uh, for most people, right? Separation is, there are a number of scholars who are like, people didn't identify, they might have been like, Haitiano Español, Haitiano Dominican, like, like a plurality of vocabulary throughout the 1840s. There's a reunification attempt in 1860s. But you could go on. So 44 is not it, just to keep it really simple. So 44 is not independence. Not, no, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not placing the title, right? But I, it's not, it's not the moment of national consolidation. I'll leave you all to anyone who wants to pick their own date. Uh, but it's not one where the majority of residents living on the eastern part of the island consider themselves Dominican. 1860, so, so August 16th, the beginning of restoration fighting is a day that people pick in 63. Um, actually, the fighting starts again on February 9th, which is actually the, an anniversary of Boyer's arrival. So that's another great date and another clear sense that the people fighting the Restoration War were fighting uh, about the independence of the island that came through Haiti. But then uh, because 1865 doesn't actually definitively solve the question, uh, there are other scholars who say that there's a whole other war that gets that, well, there is another war that gets fought and they point to that one. Mm -hmm. So right after these elite like trip and fall on their face with this annexation plan that goes kaput, uh, ending in the summer of 1865, an old guy comes to power again. Buenaventura Arias comes to power again. And he takes advantage of a weekend country and he's like, great, let's give it to the United States. Uh, and then there's a protracted war against him that is really to the death uh, uh, from 68 to 74. So there are historians who call that war the third war of Dominican independence. So it's it's really hard to pick. I don't know if it, I mean, for nationalist reasons, if it's interesting to pick one, I think that's an interesting exercise. I also think one of the most interesting messages is how difficult it was for a Caribbean place to be independent. It's incredibly difficult. And the pressures against it were just shifting. Once it was not a European power, all of a sudden it was the United States. And we all know what happens with the United States occupations of right. both sides of the island. Right. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a really great point. And, and I think for both Haiti and the DR, it's not until real well into the 1900s, you see the state sol um, right. consolidating its right. power. Yet this period in 1844 is held up um, in mo more recent Dominican narratives as Independence Day, even though, like, as you stated, there are continuous battles for the Dominican state and, and to oh, define Dominicanidad and to understand where what where the borders lie and who is Dominican well into the 1900s. So, you know, why is yeah. 1844 so important? But yeah. I, we can try to Saudi. Hi, Saudi. Someone asked yeah. if Duarte was a Freemason on the sidebar. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> I am not a Duarte biographer. Uh, Dr. Maya would be a good uh, source for that, but yes, he was. So I just wanted to add this, this conversation is really interesting. And I wanted to add like, you know, we, what is happening, you know, in terms of like people's consolidation of a black identity or an Afro descendant identity in the Dominican Republic during this like post, like the period essentially like between 1844 and like the beginning of the consolidation of these like Indio narratives in the country, right? So because there's so much disjuncture, there's so much separation between different populations, you know, do you get a sense from your research like how people were reconciling in their own terms the kinds of frictions and tensions that come from living in a multiracial society? That's a really complex question. That's a 
fantastic question. I think most folks um, outside of the coastal towns are relatively outside of the reach of the capital in, in a good way. Uh, and so external to those arguments, when you think of the San Juan Valley and how linked it is to Haiti, or you think of uh, La Línea Noroeste, the Northwest Line, uh, and how that wood economy was very much linked to Cap Haitien, um, they're not really engaging directly with the script of a few people in the capital or Santiago Los Caballeros. But the people in the towns are, uh, and they're confronting these plans, these really treacherous, really traitorous plans. Often Santana is the one who gets called a vende patria, but it's the racist coterie that's around him who, are, who want white colonization, who want any protectorate, who are very willing to play with literal fire and so town residents obviously bump up against this. And obviously they see the stratification, not of like effective communities, but of outright racism in, in, in these different towns. And so their reaction, uh, we have on the record a little bit. Um, again, as I said, the, the most of the Dominican government officials are like keenly uh, and wildly silent on this. They refuse to record it. Um, when do, most Dominicans talk about the fear of re-enslavement, they will call it the ghost of slavery, as if it were not even a living person who had these thoughts. Um, or they will say that person must be a Dominicano haitianizado. Um, like no Dominican could have these very rational fears in a Caribbean surrounded by slavery with a treacherous elite rolling the dice all the time. Uh, and so their silence makes it really hard to find uh, the ways that, these pe that people's identities were changing in towns in this period. But we know, for example, for example, in Puerto Plata, that it's an incredibly heterogeneous place with a really live uh, and productive and vibrant defense of emancipation, not just the Dominican Republic and Haiti, but of the entire Caribbean. And that's because they're receiving migrants from Jamaica, from Turks and Caicos, uh, from, from Florida, which could be Baltimore, could be South Carolina, could be all these different places. And so the conversation there is, if there's a treaty in the capital that's gonna get signed with the United States, as there is in the early 1850s, allegedly some folks marched over land from Puerto Plata down to the capital. Now, maybe they took a boat, maybe we have barely any sources, right? Uh, but these folks are keenly attuned to the actions of the few. And even though they are the few, they find them really clearly threatening. And so that's the way that we see the most direct response to the capital. The thing that's the hardest to put together, and, and Saudi, I know it's not, uh, in, previous conversations that's very interesting to you and, and probably to other listeners. The thing that's harder to put together are positive axes of solidarity, like black religious brotherhoods, um, like affection and esteem and humor, right? The things that come up on the record are mostly uh, threats. Uh, and so I think that's really an ongoing project uh, for historians who are working now. And when you mean, when you say threats, do you mean threats to their black identity and their freedom in general? That's what you mean? Yes. Threats directly that the whole territory everyone thinks once it becomes a nation it exists no like the existence of the dominican republic like the existence of haiti is threatened from the moment of of independence of haiti and it's threatened through the united states occupation that's really a crescendo of energy against black freedom that is just building it never stops it only gains power at different moments it gains power with the end of slavery ironically in other places as imperialists become more aggressive and more armed. Uh, and it gains power again at the end of the US Civil War as the United States doesn't have to solve a territory question and can think expansion, 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 expansion. And so um, those threats that the Republic from one day to the next will just cease to exist are impossible to overstate. And so moving into 1865, what exactly happens in this historical date? Like what leads up to it and what exactly happens in this war? Well, so from the first moment, uh, a number of folks don't like um, the annexation. So people, even during the ceremonies, and there's a lot of Spanish troops around to, in the towns, but people in the ceremonies, someone tears up the Spanish flag in one town, maybe Puerto Plata, I think. Uh, but the, but can, I, can I interrupt it, you one minute, yeah. for one second? So I, I think for people who may not be as familiar with the history, I think it's important to to note that after separation from Haiti, 
um, the Dominican elite then decide to annex the Santo Domingo to, to Spain for a period of time. So yes. Spain recolonizes the Dominican Republic, just to give people yes. that context. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so unification 22 years, whatever separation, 17 full years of question mark, question mark, <laughs> a small state, and then back to Spain. And this is the this could be the real test of this elite narrative that we all know that has been put into the mouth of Duarte, but that Duarte never said, which is that we're Spanish, we're Spanish, we're Spanish, we're Spanish, we're Spanish. Okay, fine. If that's the narrative that we're going to test, um, here's Spanish annexation. <laughs> uh, and so that happens on in March, March 18th of 1861, the Spanish come back. And they come back with a bunch of troops, and they come back very poorly informed from Dominican elites who have sold them the moon. Um, and, and Santana, himself a man of color, uh, who wants to stave off his opponent. And they've all said, don't worry, the Dominicans are super docile. They love Spain. They just are so faithful to Spain. Uh, and it goes for So uh, again, someone tears up the flag someplace. In May of that year, there's a small rebellion. It's quickly crushed. Um, but that man, I think it's Jose Contreras, um, he just lives on, he's executed, but he lives, people are like, oh, he was very old. Oh, he was blind. Like his fame is growing uh, in terms of like the hero's tales of people who, who dared to oppose the Spanish. And then by 1863, the Spanish are hearing rumors of opposition and people are meeting and planning. I mean, they're very used to, it's speaking of about rural society, they're used to, to planning things collectively, right? Uh, com convites are the same as combi. Uh, or the planning outside of Neiva is happening at a child's funeral. And they're plotting how to then take over the town and topple the Spanish administration. And then fighting starts, and when it starts, it explodes into a massive war. It takes up about three-fifths of the territory. Uh, and the rebels, even though they're barely armed, sometimes they would have as few as five bullets, uh, they know the territory very well. The vast majority uh, of these people who are fighting are rural people who also knew how to survive off of the land. They're cutting the Spanish off from water sources, et cetera. And the first thing they do when they roll into towns, even if they're not from that town, is they destroy the municipal building. And the reason that they destroy the municipal building is to destroy records that they considered might have enslaved them, or to just, just in general, to destroy records of the Spanish state. So that takes us up to the height of the fighting. I should probably stop there for a moment, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. What, <laughs> what's going on in Haiti at this time? Because I, I can imagine that they're, they're they see these Spanish ships coming to the other side of the island and they have to feel some kind of way about their own freedom. So what, what's Haiti's role in this rebellion and this guerrilla warfare that's going on? That's a wonderful question. So uh, first of all, they have a Republican president again. It's imperfectly Republican. Both sides of the island ha have autocratic and military administrations that are trying to spread out over the whole territory, right? But important, it was an important regenerative moment. Um, it's Fabri Nicolas Geffard. Uh, and um, he knows that this is like a terrible idea, obviously. And he issues a really ringing condemnation uh, in multiple languages. He writes directly to Dominicans in Spanish and publishes them in the state paper. And he's like, you have to resist this. This is a question of life or death. This is a slave power. If you, if for folks who are listening, Spain at this moment is not a free, em there's no such thing as a free empire, right? But this is like Puerto Rico on one side, Cuba on the other, very intense slave regimes, right? And so Jeffrey is like, this has to stop. This is unbelievable. Um, and his support uh, for early on efforts to oppose the Spanish administration brings a whole bunch of Spanish warships to Port-au-Prince. Uh, and they demand more than 200,000 pesos in indemnity and they force him into silence and neutrality. But that's not the end of the story at all. Uh, I mean, Haitian citizens openly, frankly, generously, repeatedly, openly again, widely, flagrantly oppose the Spanish occupation from, from at every moment, right? So Dominican uh, rebels, for example, will bring in a large cattle herd from the center of the island to sell in Port-au-Prince to get goods because the resistance also has no flour, they have no codfish, they have no soap, they, have, they don't have the stuff that they need to continue to resist. Um, and, and, and obviously people are doing trade with them, right? Uh, and then at a smaller scale, uh, so that's in the town, that's especially Cap, Port-au-Prince, et cetera. But there's a whole other record of particularly Haitian market women. So Paco Dieu's Madame Serra, 
uh, who are bringing the goods straight up to the Center Valley, either to the North Coast town or to the Center Valley. And they're taking, because the rebels don't have any money, they're taking trade and tobacco. And so this barter allows the rebellion to continue. And also probably almost certainly there's an, a number of Haitian individuals who offer their lives as soldiers, as, as guerrilleros in the struggle. We don't, we don't know their names. Uh, but speaking of how that threat continues right after 65 through the 70s, we do know their names at that point. So um, in the, at, at that point in the whole Dominican Haitian center south, people are fighting together. I have a question. Yes. So I want to ask, um, you know, for Dominicans who are, are, you know, encountering this history the first time, right? Like, actually, this book is um, one of the first English language sources or the first English language source that, like, really tells the story of resistance, right? For people who are encountering this history and, like, are trying to figure out, like, how to... Um, how to think of their identity in ways that are beyond the master narratives that were constructed way after this, these events were happening. You know, what is the takeaway story that you would tell those people who are trying to incorporate this particular period of solidarity, um, this particular period of um, just engagement between these two free black nations? What would you say is the takeaway for those people trying to kind of incorporate this into their identity? Sure. Oh, gosh. Um, there's so many things to say. Um, that's another great question. I mean, I think this is a, uh, a complicated and broad and heroic story. I'm going to say more because heroism is complicated, right? But it's a, it's, it's a story of tremendous effort and uh, bravery and concerted solidarity on both sides of the island against uh, 30,000 Spanish troops who are much better armed uh, and a whole, an entire hostile imperial entorno that could have threatened people. And so I would say that understanding how difficult it was for the whole island to be independent at all and what a heroic effort this was among a series of heroic efforts that began with the Haitian Revolution is like really remarkable. Uh, and meditating on that is like, no other Caribbean place becomes independent at this point in time, despite what could have been heroic efforts in many other places. Uh, and that like adjunct to that, like com combined with that is that it came at a high cost, obviously. Like it's not a simple story. Uh, despite the heroism of the people, it comes at a high cost of militarism, uh, where everyone is a general, where it's hard to kind of set up electoral politics, right? Like it's hard to build infrastructure. The country gets destroyed in this effort. Um, and obviously violence is not something that you enter into gleefully, uh, even when it's necessary to liberate yourself. I think another major lesson is to just, um, just to see how keenly that uh, the racelessness narrative was a lie. Um, it was a lie directed at distancing themselves from Haiti, elite distancing themselves from Haiti it was obviously repudiated by the folks who understood that the fear, like the racist, the fear of racist pressures around the island, uh, and it was never really that useful at the time, any more than anti-Haitian narratives were useful in this effort. Um, so it gives a lot of a lot of stuff to think about. I think you said something that I I didn't know. So I know that one of the reasons that the the unification of the island ended in 1844 was because of the threats from France that that led Boyer to sign on to this um, agreement to pay France reparations yeah. for their lost property, meaning the enslaved people that they had owned at that time. And so well, you just said that also when um, Spain takes over the Dominican side of the island, and Haiti begins to resist the Spanish incursion. Haiti is made to pay indemnity for DR's freedom. So it's and, all warships all the time. Right. And I and I think that just blew my mind. So like Haiti paid for Dominican freedom. Like literally paid money for Dominican freedom. Yeah, several hundred thousand. That's crazy. 
pesos fuertes, I think. You'd have to check the unit. Yeah, and it, I, I can't even imagine how many millions upon billions that actually translates into, into the, today's dollars, but, that, but I think that points to the high cost of freedom that the island had to had to literally pay out of their pocket. Like you had to pay for your freedom. You had to fight for your freedom. You had to destroy everything. It was a complete scorched earth effort because it was either live free or die at every yeah. single moment. And that is just like mind blowing that that happened. And especially in, given the current state of Dominican Haitian relations that, that Haiti would pay out of pocket so the DR could be free is just like, Oh, and almost certainly running guns as well, which was really important. Right. <laughs> like, and paying for those. Uh, and then all of the efforts of the uh, Haitian citizenry, prominent merchants are right there supporting the effort, common, like poor people also, traders also. And like you see, the, so to finish the story that we started a little bit ago about the fighting up to 63, uh, it gets really radical. It gets out of the hands of leaders uh, by 64. And there are people who are saying, listen, we have to reunify. And so there's someone who is a president briefly, Gaspar Polanco. The earlier provisional, they set up a provisional government during the fighting. They're like, oh, we need some HQ while we're fighting. Uh, and the earlier folks are kind of like old leaders from the past. And then there's like a, co like a common man, an illiterate cattleman. I mean, obviously he's literate in many other senses. He's a brilliant strategist. Um, and he gets pushed out of power because one of the things that he's calling for is a really, really tight bond of alliance with Haiti. As a matter of fact, he flees into Haitian territory. I don't believe he ever returns to live in Dominican uh, soil because the fighting continues after the end of this war. So what was the role of women during this period of time? So it's, 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 um, it's hard to find people by name. Uh, although I did find some, so I made a list for you. Okay, so so for folks who are like real history buffs and know the story of like all the big men who authored 1844, they probably know this guy, Jose Maria Caminero, who's a real jerk. Um, he's the author of many white uh, colonization schemes. Um, and his wife actually divorced, his wife Guadalupe, to say her name, uh, divorced him using Haitian law using an expansion of civil marriage in order to divorce him. And so there are folks who think that part of the reason that Jose Maria Caminero so strongly supported separation was because he was mad at his ex-wife. <laughs> uh, the, then we have a woman named Ramona who appears in the text of the book um, talking very adamantly about a burro. She's like, please, she writes a letter. She's like, please bring me, devuélveme ese burro, bring it back. I have to have it. Don't give it to anyone else. Don't even, you know, give it only to my brother, et cetera. And she's talking about a gun. Uh, and, and so she's clearly facilitating uh, the rebel movements in that way. Mm. Uh, we have a cat, wealthy cattle owner um, who probably supported the resistance by selling her cattle named Mercedes. Uh, another wealthy business owner, Socorro, who gets in trouble by just pretending the Spanish don't exist already in 1865. Uh, there was a woman, Petronila, who talked a Spanish soldier into deserting in the capital. There are a number of laundry women uh, whose names we don't necessarily know, but who definitely came from other islands, including Turks and Caicos, for example, like Josefa. Uh, then there's a couple, there's two sisters in the capital uh, whose story occurs in the book, and it's a very interesting um, episode. It's Juana. She's getting harassed by a group of drunk Spanish soldiers. She starts pushing them out of her mm -hmm. house, and then her sister Maria appears and starts throwing rocks at them. And as the Spanish soldiers are still insisting in their violence, Maria says, well, kill me or I'll kill you. Uh, and the Spanish soldiers get arrested. Not everybody, everything has a happy ending in the book, but um, that is the end of that episode. And then there's prominent Haitian women uh, and women of Haitian descent uh, uh, in living in Santiago Los Caballeros, like Madame Garcia, uh, who, whose name is a whole story in and of itself, um, who offer their homes to the resistance fighters. But then there are also a whole group of, uh, perhaps the majority, obviously, uh, of anonymous women uh, whose names we don't know. Um, and it's a really limited record. So we rely on scholarship um, of, of work of people like Aisha Finch, uh, who works on the island of Cuba, and other black feminist scholars of slavery, who understand women's integral participation in both plantation and deep rural settings of communication at the edges of towns, 
the way that if they're not surveilled in a certain way, they can move and spread news. And it's clear that Dominican women uh, do that very integrally in the fighting. And when you figure that the Spanish soldiers don't know the terrain, this is absolutely critical. And so the if anyone has been to the monument to the restoration in Santiago Los Caballeros, for example, there's a woman holding what looks like a football. Uh, I had no idea what this was, so I had to ask Macy Zeller, uh, who is a wonderful Dominican historian who works here in New Jersey, a university in New Jersey. I said, what is she holding? Like, is this like a bread? Like, what is it? Um, and she was like, no, no, she's holding a calabash uh, to gather water. And so you see at every point in, in the text that the, there are women who are like these integral strategists of the fighting itself, but we just don't, we're not sure of their names. You know, I think it's it's really interesting in that it's this is very clearly like a war for their lives. In 1865, it's all all or nothing. Um, yet Dominican nationalism is now per portrayed as raceless or race blind. And what purpose does that serve, given this deeply rooted um, history of black survival and black uprisings that was the foundation of the Dominican Republic? Uh, yeah, it was profoundly disingenuous at the time, uh, but uh, it was not an effort that was made in isolation. And so that's uh, one of my uh, points of irritation when outsiders who don't know anything about the Dominican Republic sit in judgment of the islands because they really don't understand the incredible white supremacist pressures that the island was under in the 1840s. And so these elites make these racist choices. Uh, and in this, at this moment, their choice to not talk about race, when you think of the pressures directed to the island, is in fact a racist choice uh, that is leaving the majority of the island unprotected to the schemes of cash crop production, of total annexation, et cetera. And part of the reason that they make this decision, uh, we started the talk about talking about how, how much in the 1840s there's pressure against Haiti still. In fact, one contemporary British scholar said it was a pro-slavery clamor uh, in the 1840s. And this pressure is because Haiti in the, its constitution, in its first constitution and through all the constitutions of the 1800s, defines citizenship as black, first of all, in its very first article. And then in an article that shifts around in the constitution, it's article seven for a while, but it's article 19 later. It says, listen, white folks, you can't own property here which is like a very keen assessment of racial capitalism in the 1800s and who is moving around with gunboats and finances, uh, which are these white financiers uh, abetted often by the power of their imperial states and their new imperial states in the case of the United States. And so um, that citizenship, not just black citizenship, but that capital and anti-capital, anti-foreign capital part of the Haitian constitution gets so much attention from outside powers. People in the United States, white capitalists and their allies in the United States call it monstrous. And so the Dominican elite are writing their constitution in response to protection for black citizenship. And so their, protect, their, their response to that is to make it profoundly neutral. Not only will I refute it, I won't mention it at all. And so understanding that that is the root of the silence uh, and also that the vast majority of Dominicans at different moments in the first 17 years before Spain comes back might have felt threatened by that lack of protection is a, a really profound thing to meditate on, I think. Sadi, do you want to add anything? We can't see you. Mm, no, I mean, I'm just reflecting on those last statements um, because oftentimes the Dominican elite um, has is invisible in the conversation about anti-blackness like there's sort of like this generalizing of the dominican population as like well everyone embodies these anti-black values without like a deep historical understanding of like you know what were the different factions the different social factions and what were the choices that they were making Right. So the, so what your point, I'm just like marinating on it because it reminds me of that quote, like if you're neutral in situations of oppression, you've actually chosen the side of the oppressor or to be an oppressor. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's just like this is really making me yeah. think a lot about um, how the DR gets framed and like who is not explicitly included in the conversation. 
And it's actually these folks who have chosen to erase, um, or who chose to erase race, but to their benefit. Yeah, yeah. You're, what you're saying reminds me to point out that it's a concerted silence uh, because they brag in private. Um, they brag to foreign powers. It was the whites who achieved separation. They say that verbatim, uh, and in private to foreign uh, to foreign interlocutors, right? Uh, in Boston, in New York, and other places, they're like, "Hey, uh, bring settlers, but bring white folks." but they won't say it openly, but they do say it. They just say it privately. And so I think that's something that's really important to note because they won't go on record as saying it because they understand the whole country was unified for 22 years. If they're an overt racist, then that also will not be palatable, but they will clearly eagerly aspire to it in so many other ways. I mean, you, you still currently see that in, in the, the dialogue around Dominicanidad, there's this silencing of blackness that's almost, that's visceral and that's often really violent in that the, the DR is one of the few places in Latin America that doesn't have a prominent um, Afro-Latino, Afro-Dominican movement, uh, Afro-Dominican presence um, visibly in terms of, of literature and things like that. Not to say that they're not visible on the island, but there's a silencing of that, that part of Dominicanidad because as soon as someone says, I am treated differently because I'm black, somebody runs out and says, no, 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 somos una mezcla de raza. We're all the same. They're in the silence. And so it's often very, very violent, in, but, but as much as they silence blackness, there's this upholding of whiteness that always happens. It's like, no, you can't be black, but you, yes, you can be Dominican Lebanese and you can be um, Dominican of Spanish descent and you can be Dominican of Italian descent, but don't you dare be you know, proudly Afro-Dominican or proudly Dominican of Haitian descent. That is not a way to be Dominican. And, and and I think it's a really interesting dialogue that happens around Dominicanidad and that it doesn't allow, like, as someone says, blackness is associated with being Haitian, but whiteness continues to be the idea, uh, a made up ideal of what it means to be Dominican. Saudi, do you wanna uh, talk, speak to that at all? Um, Sorry to put you on the no, spot. No, 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 totally. As our resident Dominican. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, as the resident Dominican, um, I think that there's like a public private script happening, right? Like, I think that um, what Anne was highlighting about the way that the elite was bragging in private, um, there's definitely like a public private script, I, I think, among Dominicans. Like, I have experienced that in my family, where like to get along in the public eye or like in sort of like in public spaces, you have to aspire to whiteness, right? I never want to speculate to the extent to which people like have internalized that, although I've seen many examples of how whiteness is so much more valued than blackness in the Dominican Republic. But I've also seen like been in spaces or seen situations where there's like an like an auto recognition of my of black heritage and Afro descendancy. Right. So I always try to take it like contextually, like case by case, because um, I've seen like both of those happening. But you're right. Like there is a complete rejection of like, can you be like darker, darker skin in Dominican? There's always a questioning around that. Right. Can you be like proudly, like proud of your of your skin and your features and your hair and also be recognized as fully Dominican? Like I've seen people be told that they're, oh, you must be foreign. Like you have your hair looks that way. You must be not from here. Because a default, I think from like, you know, the, the 1900s or sorry, the 1800s for me are a really exciting kind of like historical period. Because there's all these sort of more fluid um, things happening. Whereas like the Dominican state of recent decades, the Dominican state after Trujillo is, you know, a, a white supremacist state. Like we have to just name it what it is. I name it what it is, mm -hmm. right? As a Dominican, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is a white supremacist state, not necessarily because everyone in the population can like be that, but because it's policies, it's lack of awareness around race, um, it's lack of just like a census that like fully counts black people the way that they should be counted. Um, 
the lack of affirmative action policies for people who are of African descent and who are more visibly black, like all these things like as evidence, right, of of like a state that's not concerned with, with uplifting its black populations or naming them or fully recognizing them while continuously upholding like the same line around um, racelessness uh, and around equality, really these, mm -hmm. these, these um, diversity equality sort of narratives are on paper, but they're not actually being lived out in people's everyday experiences. You know, what I, I think is interesting about, about the way that this racelessness narrative plays out is that you have a majority black and brown population that is controlled by a white elite that has convinced them that their whiteness is not a problem. And it's it's really interesting to see that that even in talking about uh, things like affirmative action and things like that, those are usually programs for the minority. But in, in the DR, you are the majority. You sh you should be in a position of power. But because the the national narrative is raceless and it doesn't acknowledge the history of black struggles, of black liberation movements, of of Pan African movements and um, cross border movements, it it silences blackness, it silences opportunities for black people, and it, it removes black people from being productive members of society in the state in a very, very strategic way that you you don't see in um, other parts of the Caribbean. Yes, everything, I mean, I'm just interesting, interesting to listen to you both. I don't have much to add, except from the perspective of the 19th century, I see the comments on the, on the right side of the page. I can't answer them. I guess maybe because maybe only you can answer them. Yeah. Um, but um, Leo says we associate blackness uh, with Haitian nests. And I would just say, since um, we have uh, now um, from Sally and also from you, Franz, like such a brilliant description of what's happening at present, I would just say, I would underscore that in the 19th century, um, that's a positive and unqualified positive <laughs> for like a really important number of communities throughout the territory who in being associated with Haiti were associated with the end of slavery were associated with the first independent Caribbean state um, after the titles changed and it was not Haiti anymore but something new but before that title really sunk in they still would have had much more in common with a common person um, right across the so-called border, which is of course not a line uh, at that point, uh, than they would have had from another town in another part of the DR or something. Um, and they all would have shared a commitment that looked pretty Haitian, which was that uh, people of color in the Caribbean should be free. And so obviously uh, the racism, the really profound racism that was always operative uh, outside of the island and among certain parts of the island, but it's like even more massively entrenched in the Trujillo dictatorship and the economic inequalities uh, of bracero labor, et cetera, in the 20th and 21st century, that brings a different stigma that you should not feel uh, that people felt. Uh, it, to say that the vast majority of Dominicans in the 1800s were anti-Haitian would be a laughable, ludicrous, historically false thing. You can come at me with that, we can talk all day. But you could also talk to Roberto Marte or, or Kiske Elora, or Andrew Walker, or on any number of names that you could rattle off about people who understood Haiti in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, as, a, as a place that had been a vehicle for their freedom, as conversations with their neighbors, as an um, important site of solidarity for the 1860s and, and uh, liberation in that way, et cetera. Just to add a little bit about the 19th century conversation, not uh, for me speaking about identity uh, questions, I try to I like try to approach, um, but I don't say things definitively just because it's not. I don't identify that as um, my scholarly place. Um, I just want to highlight some other Dominican scholars that are doing really fantastic work. Um, the first is Dixa Ramirez, uh, who has a book on NYU Press about someone in the. Also, Leo said my mulatto relatives identify as white. I would rec. I would send him to read uh, Dixa's book. Um, or Loria Garcia Peña's book, um, or Milagros Records book, which is really wonderful. Um, or finally, there's a book in process uh, from Aida Heredia, all about these questions, all about how complicated and fractal and multiple people's identities are. And 
Um, I like from my perspective as a historian who does like the whole states or like the whole hemisphere or whatever, I would just emphasize that um, it's not just the Dominican elites who are trying to betray or mislead a populace because the populace is not stupid. People are never stupid. It's the entire pressure of the entire system of power and capital in the hemisphere uh, that was directed at, at a like a basically a gale force wind against Haiti after 1804, against the DR after 1822, against the independence of a Caribbean state. And if you walk away with only one message from my end, from this mess from this whole chat, it would be to understand all of the pressures and how racist those pressures were directed against the island in the 1800s. Can I ask you a question? And what was the importance of the Dominican Republic and Panatillian movement in that period? What did, what did the Dominican Republic mean for the African diaspora? And I ask that because I think that um, the role of Haiti in black nationalism and in black thought is very well established at this point in time. Everybody talks about Haiti as a black republic and it's um, very well known the role that the Haitian revolution played in inspiring other revolutions and other movements around the region. But we, we don't often hear about what this particular time and period in, in Dominican history meant for Pan-African, Pan-Antillian, um, movements for for Black people. Yeah, so um, the first one, this is not surprising. Uh, the first one's very quiet. Uh, uh, the Dominican Republic doesn't get the credit that it deserves for being a free space at this point in time. Maybe because, again, those narratives were didn't sound very like exciting or revolutionary that are coming out about nationalism. But um, people are escaping from slavery to the DR for this whole period. So if you consider that not as a formal tie between states, but as a project of liberation between peoples, the, then that is active for the whole 1800s. Uh, we don't have very many records of, for example, who, who's in jail. Uh, uh, but there's one newspaper from 1822, and you see everyone who got captured in Santo Domingo City uh, is por profugo de su amo de Puerto Rico, uh, as in evidence of all of the people who are fleeing Puerto Rico slavery in Puerto Rico and finding freedom in Santo Domingo. We don't know their names. We don't know how many of them are. I mean, we know the few who got captured, but that's what the DR means in terms of a project of liberation for much of the century, a very quiet one, a one that we don't really know the full story. Again, from Baltimore, from South Carolina, from Florida, et cetera. Later in the century, and this has gotten a little bit more um, work. I'm totally blanking on the name of the scholar, Leia Santos. I'm blanking, I will just, we can put it in the chat afterwards. There was great work on Luperon, okay? Um, uh, for folks who are familiar with Gregorio Luperon, who lives a remarkable guerrero lifestyle. He even bombs Puerto Plata with a rented boat at one point. Like he is about it in terms of <laughs> preventing annexation. First preventing annexation boat. from the Spain and then preventing annexation by the United States. He lives his life that way. Right, and so he is one of kind of this example of people that uh, people might know, uh, like Petances, like Eugenio Maria de Hostos. Right now, we're talking big men, uh, and which is not to which is not to cast aspersion on their projects. They're very ambitious. I just mean this like more more well known, more militaristic plan of alliance between the states. Um, and so that's really operative. It, it reaches its apex in the 1870s as fighting in Cuba has happened. Puerto Plata triples in size. Someone asked about Freemasons earlier. There's a whole bunch of new lodges, La Cuna de America. Se fue. It's like it's like a it's a it's a really um, important center of activism against Spain. Uh, and so different projects of federation like ebb and flow at that point in time, but they're largely against Spain in the 1870s uh, and to a lesser extent 1880s. And what was Luperon's role in this? And can you give us kind of a description of who he was? What did he do? Sure. Um, he is a man probably of Haitian descent, uh, du Perron, some people say. Um, I think he's born in Puerto Plata. Gosh, it's been so many years since I've written this stuff. I think he's born in Puerto Plata. If not, uh, he has, a, and then I think he has a brother who fights in the US Civil War. It's like a real 19th century, <laughs> 19th century itinerary where folks right. are everywhere. Um, he, uh, he, refuses annexation from its very first days uh, and is first active as a really important general along the Northwest line, 
which is always a hotbed of activism against corrupt presidents, or in this case, against the Spanish occupation. Um, he repeatedly refuses power, although he serves provisionally as president um, after this whole uh, period is over. Throughout his life, as I said before, he ends up bombing his own hometown uh, to oppose United States annexation. He really embodies the figure, uh, one of the figures, if you're building characters for the Hollywood movie of the War of Restoration, which I can't wait to see, um, <laughs> he is like the prominent general uh, from that movie. And he's a man of the people, actually. Um, he's not like a cattle man who already had followers, peones, who become his soldiers. No, he, like Gaspar Polanco, Gaspar Polanco is perhaps even more radical than he is, the guy who was briefly provisional president who I mentioned earlier. They wanna get rid of titles like Don and Doña. They want to uh, invigorate the language of Ciudadano, Ciudadana, uh, which obviously has a history from the Haitian Revolution, but they want to invigorate that more. There's a plan to inoculate people against, um, to, vaccine, to give vaccines in the middle of the war with no resources. I guess it's like really a pretty radical government. Um, and so he doesn't much hold power in his lifetime, but he represents a really important thread of political thought that staunchly defended Caribbean independence against first slavery and then United States capitalism. I think one of the, the interesting things that we discussed is that um, Lupe Long especially is like integral in all of these revolutionary ideas of um, panentilianism, of movements to abolish slavery, of all these all these ideologies that look sounded amazing on paper, but why didn't we see anything any of these pan out? At one point, there were cross um, island discussions between Afro Cubans, Afro Puerto Ricans, Afro Dominicans, and Haitians about you know doing something like Colombia did and creating one country, one system, like an entirely free free island block. And none yeah. of that ever planned out. Why is that? Yeah. Um, uh, trying to hold power democratically is like trying to grasp that sand if you, ha if you don't have the apparatus of a state. Uh, like if you don't, if, you're, if your country already had very limited, maybe 200,000 people are living in the whole territory uh, and around 1860, like seven people per square mile um, at, at that point. Uh, and then you devastate the landscape with like several years of war. Um, the people who come to power are the people, they like sneak back out from their hiding places. It's the powerful cattlemen from before. Um, and they take over. So Buenaventura Bias is a, is a very wealthy man and he weathers much of the Spanish occupation outside of the country, I think he's in France. And he rolls back in and he has the same coteries with the same patronage. He would have given people, for example, territory rights to sell wood or you know, cattle or et cetera, like sort of like a uh, dissemination of military privileges. Uh, and his networks are just very powerful in the absence of other networks. So those kind of democratic projects uh, faced an extreme uphill battle uh, at, that, at that point in time. I wanna, I wanna add, and this is probably the last the last I'll be able to share, but I want to say, like, I'm really moved by this book. I'm really moved by, like, the stories um, that, you know, even even in this conversation, like, I'm learning new things. I'm, like, reframing things. I'm always really pleased to be able to do that. Um, and I think it's really inspired me to, like, reclaim this legacy and celebrate these people who are nameless. Like, I've been thinking a lot about you know, how Dominicans can actually create and commemorate, like create new rituals for ourselves, right? Like, you know, instead of celebrating, understanding the histories and how they were formed, but choosing to celebrate other aspects of our history, right? So I'm, you know, I'm inspired to invite folks to come out on the 16th, August 16th, and like reclaim the smaller stories, like reclaim the people who are not named reclaim the legacy of Luperon and all that he was able to do for not just the DR for also, but also for the, for the region, right? Like, you know, there's, you know, I want to encourage people to like make the choice, actively make the choice to divert away from the grand narratives that literally were constructed in the wake of the historical happenings, right? These like stories that, you know, are not necessarily reflective of the general population are not reflective even of like historical fact in some instances. So that, that's what, something that I wanted to say because 
I think like there's so much potential in this conversation to activate like the generation of Dominicans who are like really thirsty for a decolonized history, which is really why we even do this work in the first place. Yeah, I'll say the book is free if you want it. <laughs> you can download it. It's O, the letter O, and then A P E N dot org. If you just search the title of the book, that that is my humble contribution to y'all's incredibly interesting conversation. I would also note that um, it's getting translated into Spanish and French. Yay! Uh, <laughs> well, Creole, Creole, unfortunately, is not on the is not happening yet. Um, there are two people who are translating it into Spanish: Astrid Valenzuela and Isabela Marante, and they might be finished by the end of the year. Uh, it'll get published in Santo Domingo um, by the Instituto Bono, uh, and Nadine Mondestan is translating it in Port au Prince, um, and we don't have a publisher yet. But we're working on it. Awesome. Amazing, congrats, that's a huge right. deal. It's exciting, it's super it's exciting, great. yeah. Um, you know, I think one, one of the things that I realize every time I, I talk to you um, is how big of a role white supremacy played in shaping the Dominican narrative. Because yeah. even the history of Lupe Ron, and, and I'm, I'm so glad to find out that he's of Haitian descent because I could not say his name with a Spanish accent and I kept trying to figure out why. And now I know, now I know. It's, it's maybe Dupéron with the D and two R's. Yeah, I, I can't do it. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, like the fact that that he and, and so many others um, around the Caribbean had these like pro-Black, anti-slavery, anti-capitalism, anti-white supremacy ideals and ideologies that have been completely lost to history. It's, it's such a loss to us as a people. To And in this process, we're, we're hoping that we can kind of take some of that history back, give it back to the people and kind of re-empower ourselves to live up to those ideals that our forefathers fought so hard for. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So I don't know if, if there are any final questions in the in the chat. If you guys want to want to drop in, um, we'll link to to Anne's book if you want to read it in greater detail. Um, but this was a really great conversation and just kind of a really great introduction to some of the um, foundations of. Uh, the Dominican Republic that we know today, some some of the things that we did know, some of the things that we didn't know, and hopefully it allows everyone to kind of push through, um, like push back against some of the anti-Black narratives that, that have become part of the um, Dominican identity, and also reclaim the historical figures that have defined who we've become. Yeah, I see two questions that are specific. Uh, one is 22 to 44, what was the economy? It's, it's in chapter one. Um, and then someone said, my ancestors left in the late 1700s and went to Puerto Rico. There's a great book about that by Carlos Esteban de Ieve. Um, uh, Tony, if you're interested. And then, yeah, I just agree. It was never Haiti versus DR. It was always Haiti DR versus the world. Well. Can we get, I feel like I gotta get that tattooed somewhere. In my right, right, right. <laughs> um, Axel, Axel just asked, um, the timeline confuses me around the 1820s. When did DR actually exist? Because you state that around 1821, there were Dominican independentists. Oh yeah, so there are, there are folks, uh, Jose Nuno de Cáceres, eh? um, who is a member, a sort of a frustrated member uh, of the colonial administration who was born on Dominican soil. Vocabulary fails, right? I don't know if you would identify as Dominican. Right? Mm. Uh, he planned to, to separate the state and link it to Gran Colombia. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it was a movement that is independentist. It wasn't very popular. It wasn't supported in Santiago de los Caeros, which was far more economically vibrant. Um, and it doesn't last very long. Uh, I would say uh, there are, equal if not larger movements, including even in the capital uh, of folks who are interested, who are considering uh, Haiti as the source of independence, even at the end of 1821. Um, so there's one newspaper that we that survives in the capital at that point in time, um, El Duende, uh, and they're writing about um, Boyer. Uh, Boyer would have been a well-known person to people in the capital. He was a Republican, he replaced Pétion, and then he had reunited North and South of Haiti. Um, and so, if that's your question about uh, timeline, uh, there's like blips and plans 
um, at the end of 1821 that, that don't come to anything other than unification uh, at the beginning of 1822. So I, th I think he, he might be asking the question that I kind of posed to you earlier is when, when does the Dominican state actually exist? Yeah, right. And from what you said earlier, there are there are several periods of times. You know, um, eighteen after eighteen sixty five, there's another civil war, and so there's again try to consolidate power well up into the nineteen. La guerra de los seis años. Yes. Yeah. Why didn't we remain Spanish Haiti? Great question. <laughs> you know who's gonna have great ideas about that? Um, I, I am not deflecting. I'm literally saying she's going to have fantastic research about this. Is Kiske Yalora? Yeah, I was going to say. Um, so saying. her book is her book is downloadable for free. Yeah. Um, on academia.edu, you do have to register to have an account. Uh, but she talks about she kind of parses um, even like can we talk about occupation if the soldiers were there for the first months? When is it unification? Um, the other scholar who talks about the literal vocabulary of how people called themselves is Roberto Marte. So you can see there's uh, Roberto Marte is a Dominican historian who's written a ton. Um, you can see all of the titles of his book if you go to the work cited in mine, which is free and easy to download. Uh, you might be able to download some of his books for free from the Dominican Archives website, although I'm not sure if that's currently functioning. Um, but the, one of the pieces that I'm thinking about, especially, is a, is a piece that, he, an article that he has about oral history, where he's trying to understand how individuals who we now call Dominican, might, what they might have called themselves, um, whether that was Haitiano Español, Español, uh, and you see that in some songs for a while in the 1840s, uh, or Dominicano, or like, like, um, what the fluctuating vocabulary was. There's not going to be one answer for you, just like there's not going to be one answer for like when the nation began to exist. It began to exist for different people at different times. The principle of independence and autonomy also began for different people at different times, but the independence and autonomy and no slavery began in 1822. February 9th, 1822, beginning in the capital, March in Santiago los Caballeros, et cetera. Uh, but like when that becomes a consolidated nation is a much like, it's just a more multiple, like I wish I could give an easy answer, but I wouldn't be doing you a service because it would make it seem like independence was such an easy project to realize that it just happened at a certain moment. Right. I mean, I think that's that's a really beautiful thing to point out though, is that- There's a good comment too. I'm gonna talk about this. <laughs> it's hard going. But I but just, uh, just wanted to kind of um, reemphasize what you said. I think that, that we think of independence as it's one and done. The national project is done. We are all citizens. Everybody's equal. Go cast your ballot and vote. But what we see in both evolution and Dominican history is that state building is this ongoing, very messy process. Even defining who is and who isn't part of the state, the borders of the state don't even of uh, both countries don't even get this, the defined until the 1930s. And so people don't think of themselves for a long period of time as either Haitian or Dominican. They're just kind of walking across, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think now with the way that nationalism plays out, um, especially during this particular period of time, we are very much told that like 1804, 1822, 1844, like these are the defining moments. But when you look yeah. at the way that history actually happened, it was it was so much sloppier than that. It wasn't like this one date happens and then boom, you're Haitian, you're Dominican, and these two shall never yeah. cross. Yeah, it's much more useful to understand orientation and pressures. Orientation towards defense of emancipation, pressures against that. Orientation towards my community, defense of my community, the way that justice is disseminated around me, defense against the pressures against that. It'll get you much farther to understanding how people right. live. Right. There are great comments, fantastic comments happening on the sidebar here. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter uh, brought up Romain La Prophetesse, which is an absolutely fascinating character. And there's been, uh, there's a new book by Terry Ray. There's uh, there's new work on Romain La Prophetesse. I recommend anyone um, read more about that figure. And then um, Gerald says, what about the ties between Duarte, Sanchez, and, and generals like Borgela and the Masons of the same lodge? That is another fantastically interesting question. Um, uh, 
I'm blanking on his name. He's a member of, of the Academy of History and Geography in Puerto Plant, Gaitano, and I'm blanking his last name. Does great work was, on, uh, on Masonic um, connections in this period. And of course, there are lodges, for example, there's a lodge in Aswa called La Parfaite Harmonie. <laughs> and there are people who are like, who end up being like, oh, we're so separate after the period of 44, who are straight up members of that lodge during this period, um, kind of gaining them the title. Nacy Zeller told me about the title of Gorchas, like people who just so, elites who sort of float from administration to administration, like the flag is whatever. Um, and so, and then of course, the, the Masonic lodge that I brought up before in Puerto Plata, La Cuna de America, which is so important in the 1860s in terms of Cuban independence, et cetera. Um, oh yeah, and some more great comments. Oh, everyone, this is so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so much more to say. Oh, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just going through the comments. So I, I know we could probably go all night, um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of conclude um, and really kind of tell us why you why you wrote this book in particular, why you thought this time period in within Dominican history was so important to, to talk about and why you positioned it in the greater Caribbean history as a whole. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, when I started this project, it was during uh, the second Iraq war. So I wanted to write about an unjust occupation. Obviously I'm not Dominican or Haitian. I'm from Ohio, I'm a white girl from Ohio. Um, I was lucky enough to study with Ada Ferrer uh, at New York University and her project at that point in time, which is now a beautiful book called Freedom's Mirror, uh, was about the importance of the Haitian Revolution in Cuba. Uh, and so studying with someone like Ada Ferrer, I was thinking all of the time about the Haitian Revolution. I think you could think about it for the rest of your life, uh, about what an in incredible, phenomenal, monumental, historic, massive, unbelievable, totally believable, vital, radical event that that was. Uh, and so when you were thinking about that and then you one sees kind of traditional Trujillista narratives about unification or, or um, just identity towards Haiti being negative, I was like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why would a Dominican who received his or her freedom in 22 uh, from slavery for the, for example, about 10,000 people who were freed, why would they have been unhappy about this? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so um, I ended up at the restoration because I wanted to tell the story of Dominicans who embraced um, the legacy of Haiti on the island. Yes, identity is definitely complex. This just showed up as a big part. That is absolutely the truth. So I guess if there's one thing to go away with, it might, it might be that, but it was probably what I already said earlier. And Saudi, that would be a great tattoo, which is just that, um, the putting together of only Haiti and the DR as if they were alone, that has always been a white supremacist narrative. It's always been a trap uh, in try, try to pin one against the other because of powers that did not want either to have independence at that time. Uh, you can see that in the efforts of uh, terrible treaties, horrible loan, horrible loan rates, um, civilization, like uh, citizenship schemes, outright occupation, and then United States attack and occupation. You can see that from Britain, from France, from the United States. You can see that when countries from Central America didn't even put Mar Caribe, they only put Mar Atlantico in their maps. You can see that no one respected the independence of a free Caribbean island. And, and so to put them by themselves is only to show how much the pressures were everywhere around them. And, and that's why I think the Caribbean spheric perspective is absolutely vital. Yeah. Sally, as our resident Dominican, do you want to close this out with some final thoughts? Um, I mean, I was jokingly saying before, like, it's Haiti DR against the world. And honestly, like, I, I said I was going to get that tattooed somewhere. I don't think I'm going to get that actually tattooed. I think I'm going to get the island and the, um, the black blood pride flag tattooed on my arm. Because I think people need to understand, like, that the, so many of the dynamics that um, characterize imperialism, that characterize colonization, that characterize colorism, like so many of those dynamics, like
occurred in the island, right? And also so many of the solutions, right? The undoing of those dynamics are also occurred on the island, right? Um, and so claiming DR as the second black republic like allows just a reframing of that history and the potential that Haiti and the DR have to be like a site where republicanism, citizenship, um, right relationships with nature, um, where respect for culture, identity, for blackness actually take place, right? And so I, I, love, the, I love the telling of the story because of all the possibilities that it offers Dominicans to embrace, like literally just literally like be traitors to the Dominican in that narrative that is not factually correct, that is slanted um, for particular purposes, that has been retold and compressed and really kind of turned into something that doesn't reflect the people, right? So I don't know, I just wanna say like, there's so many choices that we get, that we have the opportunity to make, um, to actually live out those principles that like launched the first black revolution, that launched the second black republic, um, and that for me, it's a very hopeful and exciting time. It's not, um, I don't want to be stuck in old narratives, but actually acknowledge the things that have happened, seek reconciliation, um, and also move into making choices around the kind of story that Dominicans get to tell about their history. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining us for this conversation. I hope the, the viewing audience really enjoyed it and that it was impactful. I really look forward to what you guys do with this information because the point of these conversations is to allow you guys the opportunity to take this information and use it to better our island and better our world. So thank you, Dr. Eller, for really just kind of enlightening us. Hey. Hey, thank you. Saudi for joining us as well. Thank you, Saudi, even though we couldn't see you. It's so okay, I'm you. here, I'm here. <laughs> and thank you guys for who participated with all these amazing, insightful questions. I'll also drop the link to Anne's book. Um, so that you guys can read it on your own time and, and you know have the opportunity to sit with some of that information because it's so such a rich um, history and such a really well done work. Uh, we are really looking forward to what you do next, Dr. L. 1890s. You'll see. Gotta, gotta be done soon. She's just like working yeah. her way through the decade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.